Okay, do you understand me? Yes. <clears throat> um, I would like to add to what was said as a reaction, the question whose fault is the situation we have? And of course, it's easy uh, to point to our, to, to, so to speak, to our enemies, the others who are the problems. I'm deeply convinced that the situation we, which we have is not mainly the fault of communists, atheists, humanists, but of the Christians themselves and the Christian churches, including the evangelicals, which I represent. To give you an example, number one, I find it again and again <clears throat> that achievement of Christian civilization worldwide, and of course in Europe, no longer have a foundation in the arguments of our churches. Let me take a very simple example, Sunday. Yeah? Sunday is some, something Christian civilization has given to the world, and it has gone far beyond Christianity. Half of the Muslim countries have their prayer on Friday, but a free day on Sunday. Tunisia, I could, uh, Indonesia, 240 million Muslims following the Christian or the Jewish Christian system. But if I look into the publications, let's start with the evangelicals. They debate questions like the Ten Commandments no longer are valid. There is no law in the New Testament. This is the time of the Spirit. Well, of course, then there is no command for ten days any longer. The whole thing fades away. So the strange thing is they still follow the system personally. Even the brethren churches go, on, go to church on Sunday. Yeah? If this would not be valid any longer, I mean, we, we could... Uh, change this, the, 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 the whole thing. And we could go, of course, uh, have, the, have the church on any other day. In reality, we don't do it. But when it comes to an intellectual defense of this, we leave it to the labor unions and, I mean, a, a, a strange mixture of, of thinkers and powers and influence who still want this, the church. And that is true for the liberal churches, the mainland churches, however you want to call it, as well as for the evangelical churches or the minority churches, the free churches. I mean, it's different in every European country, how you call them, but it's very, very similar. So we can be glad that non-Christians, at least people um, who, for whom the Christian faith is not something guiding them in their daily life, are defending something we have brought to the world. And they... And, and this is just a sample. I find this again and again with a lot of things um, that we have lost the intellectual and then, of course, beyond this, the, the power to fend the things. Let me give you an example. Um, yesterday, um, I was at the University of Tübingen, very old, prestigious university, and the law faculty invited, together with a Muslim and a Catholic theologian, um, by Amnesty International, very huge uh, event by Amnesty International to the dogma, human rights, is it a Christian dogma? Amnesty, as you probably know, is totally a-religious. They normally don't touch the topic. They even do not mention Islam, Christianity, wherever they are. They leave it, and, and they are not very good in fighting for religious freedom. It's human rights. I don't say they don't do anything, but it's surely not the center. They leave it to, to other organizations doing that. And it's for the first time that they bring the topic up because they realize that wherever Christianity is spreading, and you know for long that Christianity no longer is a Western thing, but the majority of Christians are living in the global south, and wherever Christianity goes, the idea of human rights goes with them. And you know that in a lot of countries, Christians are seen as submarines of Western human rights thinking. Uh, Christians who surely are not Western and surely do not transport this. Um, so their question is, is, is there a way to argue for human rights separate from Christianity? My Catholic uh, um, um, colleague very clearly said no, and uh, said yes. Yeah? He started out, human rights is a matter of reason, doesn't have anything to do with revelation, with God, with Christianity, and he kept with this all evening. 
Um, and in the end, you would ask yourself, why in the world is he teaching theology? If one of the best things we have to give to the world, the idea of human rights, doesn't have anything to do with God. And people afterwards ask him, if this all is true, what role does religion have then? For what do I need religion if I don't need it for the real things? And he didn't answer the thing. It was easy for me to play the game with the Muslim. I mean, he was a very liberal Muslim. He was not one of the hardcore Muslims. Nevertheless, I mean, people immediately realized, uh, people who surely were not my friends, re really uh, immediately realized that he did not really know what he was talking about when talking about human dignity, for example. Yeah? And um, he, he, he con uh, constantly spoke about um, how Muslims would relate to non-Muslims. And I had to tell him, you see, the problem of Christianity is, was, when the human rights thinking started, that most of the victims of human rights violations were Christians at that time, by Christians. Um, and this is the same is true for Muslims. Even if you would be nice to every non-Muslim in the world, your vic the victims are Muslims. In Saudi Arabia, there are so few Christians you can persecute that the victims of human rights violations are Muslims. And, and he didn't, that was an easy game. But I think the, the, the real problem was not what the Muslims said, even so it's easy to see this, is but that, that somebody that was invited to speak on behalf of Christianity had nothing else to say than we need reason, and if we argue with reason, we can be friends with everybody. We don't need any revelation, any religion. We don't need this to come to a good conclusion. But on the other side, it was really interesting. I mean, you can imagine that speaking for the evangelicals, I have not an easy part. It's not that everybody loves me anyway, so I can say what I say. I always have to overcome suspicion first. It was interesting that uh, those, those, I think, about 1,000 students that were sitting there and faculty and so on, how very open they were um, when I started out and said, Amnesty is working on a Christian concept, even so, the, the last thing they love is Christianity. They don't want to have anything to do with Christianity. But the concept, if you take an Amnesty campaign, it is an exact copy of what the evangelicals did against slavery in the 18th century, exact copy. Taking signatures, uh, I mean, the, 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 at that time in the 18th centuries, the, the, the Christians wouldn't eat sugar, once a week uh, to protest against slavery. All the concepts were invented in the 18th century in the anti-slavery campaign by the evangelicals, and Amnesty still uses it. Is. The problem is we don't use it any longer. We have forgotten about it. And if we do something like this, then I, my, my, my um, experience is my own fellow Christians, dedicated Christians, evangelicals, we say, Oh, World Evangelical Alliance, European Alliance has been in mission always, and now they start to do something about society and politics. It's the other way around. This is where we started, yeah, and we have lost it. So, um, another example. My, my wife is, um, the very moment we are sitting here, my wife is testifying in, um, in the German Parliament. There's a bait in the Human Rights Council on... Um, the Arabellion, as we call it, the, the changes in the Arab world, Human Rights Christianity. That is the title, Human Rights Christianity. So a very similar topic, and I can guarantee the reason is not that our parliament is 90% evangelical anyway, and they found a nice way to bring this into the, um, in, in, into the, the arena. Yeah? Um, there is one Muslim debater with her. Um, she is seems to be totally alone in her approach on the whole thing, speaking about the same thing we are speaking here. Gladly enough, she is the representative of the government. She has been invited by the government, so she has a nice role. But the other four enemies fighting against her concept are all theologians. And she is not a theologian. Isn't that strange? The non-theologian speaks on behalf of this. And, and um, in preparation of this discussion, a secular journalist tried to summarize what my wife wanted to say. And he chose a, 
um, um, headline, which is um, which my wife never said. She never would say something like this. But she said, this is exactly what I wanted to say. The headline was, not Islam, but the condition of the Christian churches is a threat to Europe. Yeah? That's a and I totally agree with what you say, but I say we over only can change this if we follow what the Old Testament says, says if my people, over which my name has been given, yeah, if they pray and confess their sin and start all over again, then their country can be healed. I think we have to give, when, when we do what we do here, that always goes together with a revival of the churches that see that they will die with this society and culture in which we live here in Europe, or they will give new life to it. That's a very good conclusion, and I think we're going to debate that later. So thank you, Dr. Schemacher, for your contribution. And then I will pass on the word to uh, Dr. Gary Wilson. I say thank you for your welcome. It's very good to uh, be here uh, this afternoon. I wonder how many of you have ever been in a car crash. It's a, a car crash is a horrible thing. There's a moment when you begin to realize that it might be about to happen. What's singing? Okay, can I have my phone back then? <laughs> if you've ever been in a car crash, it's horrible, isn't it, when you realize it's about to happen and you find yourself going towards the crash. And then the moment of the crash comes and you end up in a completely different place, in a completely different condition than you ever expected to end up. I think I'd like to say that Europe is in the middle of a car crash at the moment. We actually know that it has begun, and we don't actually know where we are in the middle of it, and we certainly don't know where we're going to end up and what state we're going to end up in. What we do know is it's not going to be like it was before the crash started. And I want to say that this crash has been a long time in the coming and it's going to be a long time in the solving. And it is profoundly and confusingly complex, which is quite depressing. Profoundly and confusingly complex. There will be no single and there will be no simple and there will be no quick answer to this car crash. And thus far at European level, there's been a real struggle by the heads of state and government to lead the union through the car crash. Not least because European politics is always the combination of European level com politics and national politics. So we have a combination of 27 lots of relationships and 27 lots of political conversations going on trying to solve the most complex situation that they've ever found themselves in. Thus far, the solutions have always been partial and provisional. And it's likely to be that we're going to carry on muddling through with partial and provisional responses that only seem to last so long before the crisis um, continues. And existing structures and the ways of organizing Europe are thoroughly strained. And they're going to go on getting strained. And we don't know where the strain will lead us. But the longer that the car crash goes on, the more likely that we're going to end up in a place of fundamental change. It may not be a very nice place where we end up. Certainly the crash getting there is going to get less pleasant before we get there. And a lot of our discussions have been about demand and the management of demand. And the thing that's been worked out in this last period is that we can no longer borrow in order to create and pump up demand to get growth. So my guess is the next period of time is going to be about supply. Governments will be talking about making their economies more competitive, removing regulations and protections 
things that don't cost money, but with the hope that supply might be eased up, that we might supply more efficiently, more quickly, more cheaply, more effectively, and that that might do something for demand. We'll have to wait and see. But the key, one of the key issues is debt. Personal debt, communal debt and national debt. And the painful thing is, is that debt is getting bigger. I think every member state's lot of debt is increasing. It is not decreasing. Unless I'm incorrect, and if there are economists in the room, please do correct me. But I don't think there is a member state which is saving at the moment. So the level of debt is getting bigger. It might be getting bigger slower, but that's pretty sad if that's our best hope at the moment, that debt is getting bigger slower. The weight of it is getting heavier. And the hope of solving it is getting harder. And already has been pointed out to us, we have borrowed from the past. I certainly come from a country where we have sold things. We've sold industries. We've sold government assets to help ourselves. We're also borrowing hugely from the future. I'm pretty sad that my retirement date is now 68. But I'll be quite relieved to get to 68 and it still be 68. I have a feeling it will be much later than that. We have borrowed from the past and we are borrowing from the future. Our own futures and our children's futures. And if I don't know if there are any Scots in the room, but there is a line in the Lord's Prayer in the Scottish version that really helps us here, which is forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are in debt to us. I would want us to have a public discourse, public discussion about forgiveness and debt. Politicians don't, find, and all people, do not find it very easy to be authentically sorry. <clears throat> and I have a feeling that actually there are a lot of us <clears throat> who need... Would it be chance possible to have some water? Thank you. Um, who need to be publicly sorry around debt. I wonder if we were to be really honest at this moment about the amount of debt we represent how well balanced our own bank balances are. My guess is that if we were to look back 10 years or 20 years, we as a gathering of people would have much less debt between us and possibly our churches might have less debt. How do we forgive debt? The trick governments play is through inflation, possibly by default, maybe a massive buying up of European assets from the East and the very far East. There are big questions that I'm going to end with for the discussions about how do we handle discourse about debt and forgiveness of debt in the public arena. Thank you, Gary Wilson. hope we're going to discuss that later. And to uh, the big, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff in the beginning because you reminded us of our Christian heritage in Denmark. And I checked my passport, and you are right. It's right there, the yelling stone and Christ. So you can see it afterwards if you want to. Thank you also, Tune, for your very honest and impressive speech. Yes, certainly. I always have admired and still admire you very much. I agree with you, and I think that everybody must agree that we have a crisis in Europe and in the EU, and there is room for a need of progress in the EU on many levels and in many places. But, this, but, but does this mean that the game is over? I think no, not at all. A crisis may be a gift. I want to take the positive side of this. 
A crisis may be a gift, a turning point, a place to think, to rethink, to discuss, to consider, to reconsider, to reflect on which way to go after this. Many times in our own lives, we need to do this. And as long as we do, there still is hope for success. As long as we do that, the game is not over. In times of crisis, we do need to look not only at the problems, but also at what we have accomplished. And I'm so happy about many of the results the EU has achieved. Here I want to draw our minds to a few of them. First of all, the security and peace for peoples and countries of Europe. Remember how European countries fought each other and for centuries killing each other's people with all kinds of deadly weapons, destroying each other, cities and countries. Now, instead of killing each other, we have 27 countries placed around the negotiation tables discussing social problems, environmental, agricultural, integration, banking, financial, demographic problems, how to support developing countries, etc., etc. Isn't that something? What a change. Is the game over for that? No, not at all. There's so much left to do. And another result, mobility. Just think about the young and old people who may work and study in all of Europe's 27 countries. Companies may produce, may produce and sell their goods in 27 countries. That is certainly fantastic. And last, what about support or, of or aid for developing countries? I participated in the first EU conference on development in Brussels a few years ago. In this conference, most of the African prime ministers or presidents participated, and they were treated as partners. This was really a new and very positive way of treating each other as partners, not as rich donors and humble receivers, but as partners. However, I do agree with you, Tuna, about the crisis. It is more a moral crisis and a crisis of values, a crisis of faith, of vision, and of courage. As a Christian politician, I hope that Christian politicians, officials, and everybody else in the EU will work together for Christian values, for matters like trafficking, persecuted Christians all over the world, freedom of speech, religious freedom, etc. And talking about trafficking, we now know that we today in 2012 have several hundred thousands more slaves than 200 years ago when Sir John Wilberforce in the British Parliament succeeded in abolishing slavery. He had faith, he had vision, he was courageous. He actually risked his life and his political career to save the slaves from this very humiliating and degrading life they were forced to live. Regarding slavery today or trafficking, there is so much to be done by courageous men and women today. And again, no, the game is not over. But if we only look at the results which we are not satisfied with, things we regret, we will become disillusioned and then the game will be over very soon. Instead, we need also to look at the results we are satisfied with and of course the matters which we can and must do better. We need the faith, we need the vision, we need the courage of Sir John Wilberforce and we need the faith the vision and the courage of the founding father, Robert Schuman and the other founding fathers of the EU. We must not lose sight of the values and the ideals on which the EU project began 62 years ago. We must not lose sight of Schuman's original vision of Europe as a community of peoples deeply rooted in Christian values. 
we must not lose sight of the Christian roots of the European Union. It is up to us, actually, every one of us, as Christians from all walks of life, we must work together, go on with the vision, go on with faith, go on with courage. The game is not over, but it depends on us. And then I want to close with the words uh, of uh, Tune. He said, don't be afraid. Everything is possible. And in our work, we need to emphasize the Christian roots of Europe in all we do. Everything is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Tune, for this Thank you. Thank you. My name is Lennart Sakerius. I'm a former mayor, um, MP in the Swedish Parliament, and a member of the European Parliament, and also in the Archbishop of Uppsala National Council for the Church of Sweden. But I'm more than that a happy high school teacher in religion, not serving full time in a political assembly any longer. And when teaching religion for youngsters in, in Sweden, we've been looking on something called World Value Survey. There are two parameters. One shows if a country and people is religious <coughs> or not religious. And another parameter shows if that country and the people there put faith to family, to the nation, and, the, to, com and to the community, and to the traditions, or if it does not. It's more individualistic orientated. And least religious and most individualistic of all these countries in this survey was Sweden. A little more religious, but still quite unreligious, was the other Nordic countries. A little more national, a little more municipal, community orientated than the Swedes. More religious, but still individualistic, the Americans. More religious, more nationalistic, the Irish. And even more religious and even more nationalistic in this survey, the Poles. Maybe you can find something from Europe of today and from your own nation in this type of survey. But we have to remind, and thank you so much for all the contributions given. Thank you so much for that. Um, is that we have a world where Christianity is growing. It's still the biggest faith and world religion of all. In Africa especially, but also in Asia and parts of America, Christianity is expanding and churches are building and congregations are formed like never before. The big topic, the pessimistic topic, but the relevant topic is, is game over. And in a few points, I'd like to give some sort of contributions concerning the answer Christianity and the Christian faith is still very relevant and we can give relevant contributions in a number of areas and I will list that very briefly where we can give contributions in a Europe and in a world of course that is more and more pluralistic. First of all the need for every one of us to have a spiritual life. The soul is hard to define but it exists. There is a spiritual need to all of us, and we also have to motivate ourselves, not just to get up in the morning and to do and fulfill our duties. But if a person does not feel well, that does not necessarily mean that he or she has the fever. It could also mean that her soul or her inner health is not that good. The second thing with relevance, if spirituality and the need for that is the first, is that mankind and every individual in itself and every society has a need for a moral and ethical um, moral and ethical ideals and guidelines and values. We have to look for the decent society and where do we find that if we cannot contribute telling that mankind has something else to live for than drugs or a society that is not treasuring life, but treasuring death. Thirdly, if we need spirituality and more unethical guidelines, we also, need, we also have social needs to build a society, to build community, to bringing people together. 
And we also have the societal needs in the sense that all of us, or in our very close surroundings, have experiences of how people are not having a good life. They have needs in different ways, socially, economically, spiritually, or whatever. When I, as a young man, visited the former East Germany, I was surprised that there were many more Christian hospitals in Germany, East Germany, sorry, in East Germany, the, the former communist state, than there were Christian hospitals in Sweden. But these Christian hospitals in Germany, East Germany, they could focus on people that were not dangerous for the Communist Party and for the leadership. That were people that had mental health problems, that had functional or medical health problems, and they could not challenge the power. But Christian love and Christian hospitals were helping these people. In a survey done by 10,000 people in the Church of Sweden, the most uh, given answer was that the Church of today should focus on social justice and social work and help the socially needed in society. Fourthly, we need a society where traditions and belonging, identity, historical roots are treasured as a base for meeting the unknown future. Church and faith can help us with that, overlapping the gaps of generations. Fifthly, uh, fifthly we need a society where philosophy, faith, belief, trust is given to each of us, and that we can trust that society and life itself is good. When I meet my youngsters back home in my small town in Sweden, I tell them, and they get a lot of points if they answer correctly on that question, that the Christian view of man is based on that every man is equal, unique, and cannot be replaced. That our value is absolute and is not half. You don't have a half value or a three quarters value as a man, but a full value and that life itself is unviolable. That gives four good points, and the youngsters in Sweden and my classes, they score it. But also, it should be mentioned that the Christian view on how God, the Creator, looks upon us is that we are immensely loved and that we are incredibly valuable. That can give us something to base our life upon and give us that self-esteem back that our culture and our society and that we as individuals need. Sixthly, and I'm coming to the end, is that we also need a society based upon not just community, but we need community, and I will come to that, but also freedom. And that freedom, I remember when being serving in Brussels, a seminar run by a political force in the European Parliament for the need of more atheism and less religion in Europe. And there was a Hungarian there, and he said, when we lived, when we lived in these days of communism and oppression and dictatorship, you took everything from us. But we kept our faith, we kept our conscience, and now you, after we have entered the European Union, would like to take even that from us. The faith we kept, now you want to take that from us. We kept the conscience, now you want to take that from us as well. And seven, seven point, and the, the, the last point, is that Christian faith in a pluralistic Europe and a pluralistic world could contribute in a relevant way on all these areas that are based upon human basic needs, where we could have a rich history, where we have a rich history, and where we can contribute a lot. The Christian self-esteem and self-confidence, it's time for that to come back. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Um, now, um, I was supposed to give uh, a short perspective on these issues, but I think you look like you're doing great. So, let's take those five minutes so you can stretch your legs and perhaps get another cup of coffee, and then we'll meet here again in, let's say, five minutes. <laughs>